message. Uh, we've been in a series lately called Ever Wonder Why, and we've been asking some tough questions. And we've been just hitting these tough questions head on. And today we're going to go over an, another tough question for us to answer. Um, I was joking with, I'll tell this joke, we, we like to I like to kind of joke about things if you're new here and you don't know me very well. Uh, because of all the baby dedications and all the new people in the room, I said, you know, we should do a message on tithing so we can just, <laughs> you know, like all the new people here. No, I'm kidding. If you don't know, I'm joking. I'm sorry. But yeah, so we're in this series, Ever Wonder Why? I've got a question for you. Does anyone here, if you have, any, if you have a bad habit, anyone here have bad habits, you can just shout it out. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, yeah. Better yet, husbands, shout out your wife's bad habit. <laughs> uh, next week, our church is half empty because half of the men are dead. Now, we all have these things in our lives that are, that are bad habits. Um, you know, there are things that, that we don't want to do that we do. There's like the little annoying things that we do. Uh, my wife would say that I have a bad habit of using whatever toothbrush is in the bathroom that I'm in. So... <laughs> Maybe it's her toothbrush, maybe it's my toothbrush, maybe it's Benjamin's toothbrush, but whatever's there, I, I use it. That's something that she gave up on a long time ago, the idea that we would have our own separate toothbrushes, but you know, that, that's one. Some of us have bad habits, uh, like where we bite our fingernails. Some of us wish that we could stop smoking. Some of us, it's the way like that we chew, or it's the way that, that, that we kind of, kind of do things in our day, but we've all got these things in our life that we would consider like a bad habit. It's like that thing, oh man, I, I wish that, I, wish that I, I didn't do that. I wish that I could break that. You know, I wish that I didn't have the habit of eating um, you know, a, a bunch of ice cream before bed, or I wish I didn't have the, these, these certain habits that kind of shape my day. And, and we feel the tension. Some of them are kind of funny, and they don't you know, really impact us all that much. But then there's other bad habits that like, they really like hit us hard, like they, they impact us, they affect us, they play a role and they take a toll on our lives. And for those bad habits, the question is this, is have you ever tried to break a bad habit? It, it's so difficult to do. I mean, it's unbelievably difficult to break some of these bad habits. They say that it takes about 28 days, 21 to 28 days to rewrite a habit. So if you have a bad habit that you want to break, not doing that or doing something in place of that, it takes 21 days or so, between 21 and 28, depending on how your brain is wired and how you're made, not only for you to, to break and form the new habit, but for the things in your mind, the way that your mind depends on things, even the way that your brain would get this dopamine hit from doing that bad habit. So if you're nervous and you're stressed out and you bite your fingernails, that, that's, that's giving you a little bit of a dopamine hit. It's like it's a comfort zone. And it takes time to rewire your brain on that. And so as frustrating as this is, it's almost daunting to think that, man, for me to actually break one of these bad habits, it's going to take three weeks. Like, that's, that's crazy. How can I even, like, hang in there for that long? But, but that, that's the science. That's about what it takes. So some people are lucky, and they're gifted, and they just make a decision and say, okay, I'm no longer going to do this, and I'm going to quit. And then they quit, and they walk away from it, and, that, and that's it. But that, that's a rare, select few of people. Um, I'll tell you a, a, a thing that I went through a long, long time ago. So I'm 39 right now, I think. And when I was 18, 19 years old, I, I started smoking cigarettes. And I smoked, thought, well, okay, this is something that I'll do that's kind of cool. I'll smoke for a couple years. And in America, we have this other thing called dip. And dip is this kind of like tobacco that's chopped up and you put it in your lip. I'm sure you guys have seen it like on the movies. And, and so I, I dipped and dip was great because it didn't smell like cigarette smoke. So I transitioned from, from smoking to dip. And I was trying to quit this bad habit and it was like impossible. I felt like I was going to have to relearn how to do all of life uh, without a, a dip in, without the reliance on nicotine or on tobacco. And no matter how many times I tried to quit, I just absolutely could not quit. And the thing that, that actually got me to quit was I heard from God, and God spoke something to me. And just like that, I walked away from that habit, and I never touched it again, and have never been tempted to touch it again. And we're going to talk about that later, but the frustrating thing is, and I could identify this with at the time, 
And I'm sure you can identify with this now. If you think about the bad habit that you want to quit or you want to drop. See, you, you want to change and you tried to change. And you've even asked God to help you change, but it didn't work. It, it, it didn't work. You still have this bad habit that you're struggling with. Now, I want to broaden the bad habit scale and bring, it in, bring in some more, more uh, extreme or meaningful things, things that really impact our relationships. So let's say you've got that addiction to pornography, and it's wrecking your marriage, or it's wrecking the way that you view the opposite sex, or it's wrecking the way that you view yourself. And you want to change. You don't want to look at that anymore. You don't want that in your life. You've tried to change. You've done everything. You've put the things in your browser. You've, you've put the, the safe search thing on there. You've brought in accountability partners. And you've even asked God and you've begged God, God, please change me. Please let this change me. But you find out that it's still not working and that you still can't get over it and you still can't get beyond it. Maybe it's not pornography. Maybe it's that nighttime drink. And, I, and I'm not saying alcohol is bad, but hey, a lot of us use it as a, as a bad habit. We use it to bring ourselves down. We use it to regulate ourselves. We use it to take place of something else. And so maybe it's that, that you're saying, man, why can't I stop doing this? I want to quit doing this. Maybe it's overspending. Maybe it's, it's doom scrolling when you're on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or TikTok, and you should be working. You should be uh, out with the kids. You should be cleaning the house, or you should be a father or a husband, a daughter, a son, or whatever it is. But instead, you're, you're doom scrolling through social media because you don't want to face you know, what's actually happening in your life. And you form this bad habit of every time I come into my house, I pick up my phone. Or every time I sit on the couch, I pick up my phone and I start scrolling through. And, and you're asking to change. But for some reason, you just can't quite change. Now, I hope that we can all identify with something in our lives that we really struggle to change. And, and that brings us to the question that we're asking today. Because we've been asking questions in this series, and the question is, is why can't I stop? Now, this is the question that I hope really hooks you into this message. Because I want you to think about that habit and think about the reality that you're faced with day after day after day after day, where you ask yourself, why can't I stop? I know this isn't good for me. I don't want this in my life. This is not how I see my life moving forward. When I think about the ideal Chris, I don't see the ideal Chris with this bad habit in my life. So why can't I get away from that? Why can't I stop? See, if we could just answer this question, if we could stop, then, then all of us would look exactly the way we want to look. We'd all either gain weight or lose weight. We would all either... Um, you know, we would choose everything that we, we ate. We would choose everything that we consumed. We would choose the perfect parent. We would choose the perfect son or daughter. Because we would say, oh, well, I don't like this about myself. I'm just going to stop. I'm just going to change it. But that's not the way it works. Instead, we find ourselves asking, why can't I stop? And so to be able to understand that, what I want us to do is dig into kind of the, the, the behavior of it. We're going to look at a couple different components of that behavior. But we have to know this. We have to know what is going wrong when I want to change or stop a behavior but cannot. So it is, it's not just a matter of you're not good enough or you're not strong enough. There's, there's stuff that's happening that's keeping you from stopping. There, there is, and a lot of them are, are things that, that you can very easily identify in your life. So the first element that could be keeping you from stopping a behavior that, that you seem to not be able to stop is a practical element. And I've got here, duh, written underneath it, because this, this is the most common sense thing that I can think of. So if you say that you want to stop eating donuts, but you go to the store and you buy donuts and put in your house, well, then it's obvious, practically, you're not going to be able to break that habit. Because you say that you want to stop eating donuts and junk, but then you go to the store and you buy and you fill your house with it. If you say that you want to stop drinking, but yet you build a brand new open bar in your home with a beautiful countertop and you stock it with the finest whiskey, it's, you can't really walk outside and be like, man, I really wish I could quit drinking, but you know, it's so difficult, you know. Let me go lean on my brand new bar and mull it over with the whiskey 
Like those are the practical things. There's practical reasons why you can't break the habits that you're trying to break. They're very practical. Don't overthink this. This could be something that's so simple. See, I, I have this thing where, where I love like sweets. I love food that comes from, from a petrol station. Petrol stations are like <laughs> heaven for me. You go in there and just the plethora of bar ones and chewy things and cookies and crack. Like I, I love that stuff. But you know what? It's not practical for me to drive by a petrol station sometimes. So I go, the, I go a different way home. And that keeps me from going by it. That's a practical thing that I put in my life to keep me from eating a Snickers bar. So guys, we, we can put practical things in our life to help us to stop bad habits. But there's often practical things that we need to address before we can even consider stopping a bad habit. Another aspect of why we can't stop these habits is, is an emotional aspect. So these would be the wounds, the baggage, the unresolved issues that we carry. Listen, there's a lot of hurt in this room. There's a lot of hurt in these hearts. There's a lot of hurt in the experiences that you've collected. There's a lot of emotional pain that's associated with a relationship or, or a family member or a job or a situation in your life. And it's these emotional wounds that we left that are undealt with. It's this baggage that we carry that we refuse to put down or, or let go of. It's the unresolved issues that, that we're too afraid to go talk to somebody and resolve. And it's these, these emotional elements that keep us from breaking bad habits. Another element is relational. There's a relational element. This is people in your life. If I say, you know what, I want to break the habit of speaking poorly about myself. But the people that I hang out with are toxic, then, and all I do is hear them speak poorly about other people, it's going to be really hard for me to change the way I think about myself. See, your relationships impact you more than, more than you know. Either you're impacting somebody or they're impacting you. It's one or the other. There is no neutral ground there. So do you have toxic people in your life? And then another one is, is a physical element. And, and this, is, this has to do with your brain and chemicals. And what I'm talking about here is the way your brain is wired. How much um, do you make the right kind of chemicals? Are you more prone to anxiety? Are you more prone to depression? Are you more prone to being highly strong or more introverted or more extroverted? But there's these, these physical things about the way that, that we're wired that impact why habits are, are easy to break and why habits are hard to break. It, it's, it's a, it could be a way that your body is made. Now, you've got those four, and all those four play a role in helping us to, to break bad habits. But there's one that I think really encapsulates all of it. There's one that's really at the root at all of it, and this is a spiritual element. It's, it's an element of the Spirit. This, this is why you can't break your bad habit. See, you're trying to meet a need or desire or fill a gap with something other than God. That's, that's what's happening. See, as a, as a spiritual element, as spiritual beings, we were created to have a relationship with God, and we were created to have a relationship with others. And the reason that we turn to things like pornography, the reason we turn to toxic relationships, the reason that we turn to alcohol, or we turn to overspending, or we turn to, um, to gluttony, overeating, the reason we turn to those things is because they're giving us a reward, they're filling us. They satisfy us. They give us some kind, of, um, satis some kind of completeness, this sense of, well, if I just, if I just consume this, it makes me feel full. It numbs the pain. It takes away the issues that I feel. I can ignore what's happening in my life by doing this instead. And what's happened is you're filling a gap that should only be filled with God, and you're filling it with something else. You're putting something else in place of where God should be in your life. Now, this is the point where I want to address whether you're a Christ follower or you're not a Christ follower. Maybe it's your first time to church. Maybe you have no relationship with Jesus. Or maybe this is your hundredth time to church and you just you still kind of decided, I, I don't really have a relationship with Jesus, nor am I really looking for a relationship with Jesus. I do want you to understand this. Whether you believe in God or not, the truth remains is that you were created as a relational being. You were created to need people. You were also created to need your creator. You were created to need God. 
And as someone that is created to need God and created to have a relationship with God, God made us so that we are compatible with Him. It made us so that, that His love comes to us and we can receive it and we can choose to love God because He gives us free will. And when we choose to love God, He receives it. See, we were made compatible with God, the creator of the universe. It's like our pieces were meant to fit together. Well, guess what happens when you have God's pieces and they butt up against your pieces, but you filled all the cracks of your pieces with bad habits, with alcohol, with drugs, with porn, with whatever it is. You filled those cracks with that. And when you try and come together, that compatibility is broken. The two of you don't fit. And then that leaves you feeling more empty, feeling like you need more, like you want more. And so then you dive deeper into those habits, those comfort zones, those false comfort zones, those false realities. You go deeper and deeper and deeper because you're not getting the thing that you were created to get. You're trying to make yourself compatible with a world that is full of hurt and sorrow and shame and, and investing on things that don't return joy back into your life. When the whole time God is up there saying, hey, I made you compatible with me. So I, I, want, I want us to fit together. Stop trying to put other things in this gap. Now, fortunately for us, what we have is God didn't leave us unable to meet with him. He didn't leave us so that we were forever incompatible with him. And God ends up giving us this tool. And in fact, it starts with Adam and Eve at the beginning of the Bible. When Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden because they sinned against God, because they ate from the tree that they were told not to eat from, because they put themselves in a position equal to God, God kicked them out of the garden. But then after that, if you look at your Bible from Genesis to Revelation, it is nothing but the story of God pursuing us to have a relationship with Him. And one of the secret weapons that He uses... One of the most powerful things that's in the Bible, one of the most powerful foundational values that we believe in here at South Point Church, and that really the church as a, as a whole believes in, is this thing called the power of grace. Now see, it's the, the power of grace does more in your life than you know or, or than you understand. You'll never be able to understand the power of this grace. See, the way that grace played out for you is when Jesus hung on the cross and he stretched his arms out and they were nailed to the beam and his feet were nailed to the beams and they hung him up in the air and, and he's standing there he's, or he's, he's hung on the cross and he's saying, God, Father, take this cup from me. And he surrenders his life for us. And when he surrenders his life, the moment that he surrenders it, he takes on the sin of every person that would ever be and every person that ever was and every person that currently is. And he takes every single sin on and he takes from us everything that would separate us from a compatibility with God. See, in that moment, the power of grace was, was made an example for all of us. It's the most powerful thing that we will never wrap our head around. In our life, we're lucky if we can only if we can only fathom a taste of it. And see, when we taste little bits of God's grace for us, it's like, it's an amazing thing. We can't believe how good it is and how much He loves us. But guys, I just want to assure you, that is just a sliver of what Jesus did for us. And so, what, what is grace? I want you to understand what grace is. Grace is the unmerited goodwill and favor of God. It's the unmerited goodwill and favor of God, meaning we don't deserve it. It's unmerited. We did nothing to earn grace. Absolutely nothing. And it's, it's, it's good. Favor or grace is good will. It's favor. It's for us. It's from God. And we did nothing to deserve it. There's a verse in Titus 2, chapter 11, that, that begins to kind of personify this for it. And it says, it says this. For the remarkable, undeserved grace of God that brings salvation... It has appeared to all men. So this is a simple verse that carries an unbelievable truth. See, because of this verse here, because of the truth that's in this verse here, every person, man, woman, child, has the opportunity to have salvation brought to them. This verse should be one of those verses that we celebrate over any other verse in the Bible. And I'm not saying, you know, 
don't get me wrong, all, all the Bible is good. But this one should get us extra excited. Because when you're up against your bad habit, when you're up against a hard day, when you've yelled at the dog, or you've been a bad husband, or you've turned to that thing that you're trying so desperately not to turn to, this is happening. This is happening in the background. This grace that Jesus poured out on the cross for you, it is bringing salvation to you. And it will continue to bring it to all men. And so then it goes on in Titus 2, chapter, or chapter 2, verse 12, and it says this. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. So here, you know, the last verse is saying, God's grace is for you and it gives salvation to all. And so now you have God's grace. Now you have the ability to be saved from your bad habits, saved from your sin. So God gives you grace. You've been saved and given salvation. And, so there's an and to this statement, we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. Insert bad habit right there. We're instructed to turn from that. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, which wisdom comes from God, righteousness comes from God, and devotion to God. See, th th this, is, this is the product of receiving God's grace. It's, it's God is saying, that this is how I want you to live. Once you've received this gift of grace, this is kind of how I want you to live your life out. And I, I love the part in the previous verse that talks about salvation to all men. See, salvation is us being made right before God through the grace of Jesus. That's what salvation is. Salvation is, is us being made right before God through the grace of Jesus. See, I want you guys to understand that. See, I, I, I feel like I, I almost need to like pause here for a second because I feel like somebody in the room is dealing with something right now. See, salvation is us being made right before God through the grace of Jesus. And see, there's this thing called, called, that I call the lie about grace. Because someone out there right now is thinking to themselves like, well, this doesn't apply to me. I, I, I don't deserve the salvation. I don't deserve the grace. Because I feel too bad about my bad habit. You know, Pastor Chris doesn't know exactly what I'm into. He doesn't know what I'm dealing with. My family doesn't even know what I'm dealing with. Salvation to all. Well, you know what? I, I, I still can't, I can't go one day without giving in to my, my primal desires or giving in to my bad habits. And we, we, we believe this lie where we sit in the seat. Some of you are sitting there right now and you've already shut this down. Not because you don't like it, but because you don't believe in yourself enough. You haven't tasted what it's like for God's grace to be poured out for you and be poured out over you. See, this thing isn't about you and what you can do or what you cannot do. This thing is about what God has already done for you. So I want to take this back to the original question, because I want to make sure we all journey this thing together. Why can't I stop doing my bad habits? Why can't I stop these bad habits? See, the problem is, why can't I stop? I. Why can't I do it? And, and that feeds into this lie about grace of, of God gives me grace, but then what do I have to do to maintain it? What do I have to do to continue to earn it? What do I have to do to continue to qualify for grace. See, th this message is probably taking a, a, a little bit of a turn for you. Because when you talk about how do I stop doing my bad habits, you're probably thinking, well, here's a one, two, three. Let me give you three easy reasons or three easy points to break all of your bad habits. And I could do that. Cover yourself with honey and roll around in Cheerios. <laughs> There's the first one. You know, but that's... But th that, that doesn't actually address the heart here. See, what I want to do is I want to do something that addresses your heart rather than addresses your behavior. Because if we can address your heart, then the behavior will change beyond that. And see, I, I want us to stop believing any kind of lie about grace that maybe we're trying to, uh, or, or that maybe we, we believe day in, day out, day in, and day out. And in fact, instead of believing a lie about grace, I want you to replace that statement with this, grace not only saves, it sustains. Grace not only transforms, it forgives. See, this grace, this thing that Jesus did on the cross for you, not only did it save you, but it's good forever. 
When you accept Jesus, it is good forever, despite your bad habits or your good habits. Grace doesn't just save you. It sustains you. It goes with you day in and day out. It's there with you when you wake up in the morning. It's there with you when you go to bed at night. It's there with you when you pull into that place, that parking lot, that parking spot, that building that you know you shouldn't be at. And you pull in and you know you shouldn't turn the car off and get out of that seat. And you know you shouldn't walk into where it is that you're about to go. And in that moment, whether you succeed or whether you fail, this grace is still there with you. And it won't leave you alone. And if you turn to it, it will continue to sustain you. And grace, it not only transforms you. See, when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, when Jesus died on the cross for us, it transformed us. And it took us from this being that could only be and represent sin to now this being that was made completely compatible with God to fit together perfectly with Him. And so it absolutely transformed us. But it doesn't stop there. Because when you get out of the car, or you go into that shop, or you spend that money, or you open that website, God's grace is there to forgive you every single time. See, what enables you to reject your bad habit? It's not your grit and your effort, but it's God's grace. See, this is where we've gotten it wrong the whole time. This is why I'm not giving you three easy ways to break a bad habit. Because we think that it's our grit and our effort that breaks our bad habit. Man, if I can just go, I'm, it's like, there's all these apps for your phone, streaks, you know, every day, okay, I'm going to read my Bible, I'm going to work out, I'm going to brush my teeth with my own toothbrush, I'm going to take the dog for a walk, I'm going to, I'm going to, not eat sugar. I'm going to not do whatever. And then you start out and the best day to start a new habit or plan is Mondays. Yeah, because there's always another Monday and Monday is the best day to start. And by Friday, you hate yourself. And so you say on Monday, I'm going to start. And because you're starting on Monday, Saturday and Sunday is a blowout. It's a free for all. Because you're starting on Monday. And then Monday rolls around and you get about halfway through the day. And and that, that, that guilt that fed you on Friday, that shame that fed you on Friday, it starts to wear off. And then we we maybe get one day, two days, three days into a streak. Or we're ticking the boxes and we're doing good. And man, we're trying so hard. We're putting everything that we have into it. And we're into it. And it's, it's about our effort. But you know what? Your effort will run out. Your effort will run dry. Your effort will fail you. Your effort will fail your family. Your effort will fail your friends. Your effort will fail. You are not limitless in power. You are not limitless in your ability to overcome sin. In fact, you're not even, you can barely even control your own thoughts. And I speak from from an expert on that. I can barely think good about myself half the time. Half, Half of my day is spent convincing myself that I'm not as horrible as I keep telling myself that I am. If I can't deal with my own thoughts about myself, then how am I going to put the effort into changing a bad habit? I just don't have it. I don't have the strength. I don't have the ability to stop a bad habit. I don't know about you, but I I actually can't do anything. I can't do anything on my own. I just don't have it. It doesn't exist within me. And you know what? I'm thankful. I'm glad that it's not about me. And I'm glad that it's not something that comes from my own power or my own ability. Because I would much rather God's grace do it for me. Right? Right? How much more, who's ready to stop trying so hard and fail over and over and over again? Who's ready to stop failing? Who's ready to stop working so hard? Who's ready to put an end to Guilty Friday, Blowout Saturday, and Hopeless Monday? Who's ready for that? Because if you're ready to put an end to that, then instead you have this thing that you can lean on That is just God's effort. See, Paul writes in Ephesians this really encouraging verse to us. And he's writing to a church in Ephesians, and he's trying to give them some encouragement. 
because he knows that they're dealing with some stuff. They're dealing with, with a lot of hardships in their church. And so he wants to speak to the heart of the matter, just like we're speaking to it this morning. And he says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, his unlimited resources of grace, his unlimited resource of love, his unlimited resource of forgiveness, his unlimited resource of accepting you for who you are, despite how you are, God's unlimited love pouring out over you and over you and over you every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and every day in between, I pray that his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. See, the strength that you have comes from within because that's where the the heart is. It's not here or it's not in a muscle or it's not in... Uh, the, the, the body's ability to just fight really hard or deal with stuff. Now, Paul's speaking to here, the heart, because that's where you need the inner strength. That's where you need God to do something to set you free. This is where you surrender. You surrender this, and you let God have it. That's that inner strength that Paul is talking about, and it, it comes through the Spirit of God. And so when the world says to try harder... Grace says to trust more. See, I would much rather take my bad habit and stop trying hard and instead trust God with it more. I would much rather take my bad habit and instead of feeling guilty about it, trust that God loves me despite the fact that I have yet to conquer it. I would rather take my bad habit and instead of feeling like a failure and going through the Friday to Monday cycle over and over and over again, I would much rather just say, you know what, I'm just going to trust God more that he's still with me. He's not forgotten me and he empowers me and he fills me with his spirit and he loves me. I want to stop being known as a failure and instead be known as someone that is loved. Now, this is hard for us to do. It really is. It's almost, it's almost unfathomable for some of you. And some of you have already jumped back into that lie about grace. Well, Chris, this all sounds wonderful, but does this really actually change anything? Does it change me? Is my day going to be different? Is my week going to be different? What's going to be different? And it's okay to ask these questions. And in fact, going back to Paul, Paul asked these questions as well. In fact, Paul asked God, Three times that God would take uh, what he called a thorn in his flesh from him. Three times he said, God, take this from me. I'm tired of carrying it. I'm tired of it impacting me. Take it. Please just let go. Let me be free from this. And and this is how God responds to him in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It says, but he has said to me. So this is God's response to Paul. Basically, he says, Paul, I'm tired of hearing you whine. Be quiet. Listen to me. You keep asking me for something, and I'm not going to give it to you, and here's why. My grace is sufficient for you. My loving kindness, my mercy, they are more than enough. They're always available, regardless of the situation. You know, I would love for you to be walking into one of your tempted moments, one of your bad habits, and for you instead... What you want is God to take it away from you. But instead, what if you walk into that bad habit or you walk into that, that, that desire or that situation and instead you start quoting scripture over it and you say, God's grace is sufficient for me. God's loving kindness is, is enough for me. His mercy is more than enough. He is always available and he's there regardless of the situation. And then Paul continues in verse 10 and he says, For my power, this is God talking, for my power is being perfected and is completed and shows itself most effectively in your weakness. God's power is completed in our weakness. So therefore, I am so thankful that I have so many weaknesses because I have so many potential areas where God's power can be completed In my life. Casey and I started doing something years ago. Instead of letting things get us down in our marriage or in our life, the car breaks down, kids get sick, you know, all kinds of things happen. Instead of being like a, whoa, whoa, woe is me, we started saying this thing where we started to say, thank God that I have an opportunity to need God more. Thank God that I have an opportunity to need God to do this miracle in my life. Instead, I'm just going to be thankful for it. 
I'm going to thank God for it. And, and th- th- this is where Paul is starting to pick this up and say, Hey, you know what? I'm so thankful that through my weakness, God is made strong. So bring on the weakness. Bring it on. Let me own it. And he goes on to say in, in, in this verse, he says, Therefore, so Paul is saying, Okay, Jesus. Okay, God. If this is the way you say it's going to be, then fine. Therefore, I will all the more gladly boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ may completely enfold me and may dwell in me. So Paul is saying, okay, fine, I'll own it. I'll own it. And not only will I own it, I'm going to take you up on the offer, God, and I'm going to boast in it. Boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ may completely enfold me and dwell in me. See, what I hope that we do today is, is today I declare that I'm not trying harder. I'm trusting more. Okay? I'm not trying harder. I'm trusting more. Somebody, you know, declare that over your life. Hey, I'm not trying harder anymore. I'm trusting more because God's grace is sufficient for me. That bad habit that I'm so frustrated that I can't quit, I'm going to stop trying. I'm going to completely stop trying. And instead, I'm going to trust God more. I'm going to trust that God can work in me. God can work through my life. God's strength can be made complete in my weaknesses. I'm done trying. See, we're about to talk about this, the last thing here. And, and it's understanding grace gives you permission to be honest. But I, I want to make sure that we're all in the same place. You have bad habits because you live in a world full of emotions and people and you have physical challenges, you have all these things and you form bad habits and those habits have drug you down and they make you feel like a failure and they fill you with guilt and they consume you and they take over your week. And what we're saying today, the, the whole, just to make it so, so simple for you is that you will never be able to conquer those habits, nor should you. Instead, God's grace through His Son Jesus on the cross is sufficient for you whether you conquer the habit or not because you are His if you so choose to be. Now that should be a very freeing thing. I'm not going to try harder. I'm going to trust more. When you get to that place, this, this is where it gets really important. This is where, it's where it gets special. When you get to that place, you have the permission to be honest. Now, this is honest with yourself. This is honest with your family, honest with your partner, honest with, with your spouse, honest with somebody. Because you got to be honest about who you are, and you got to be honest to other people about who you are. But it's time to look at your situation honestly. And for some people, that starts with just saying, you know what, I have a problem. And I am no longer going to hide that problem. I'm no longer going to try harder to cover that problem up. Instead, I'm going to trust God more with it. And part of me trusting God more with it is I'm going to put my hand up and I'm going to say that I have a problem. See, when you know that the same grace that saves you is the grace that sustains you, then you can finally be honest. Let me say that for you again. When you know that the same grace that sustains you or the same grace that saves you is the grace that sustains you, then you can finally be honest. That means that, that you never are going to be without God's grace. Ever. Ever. Now, the, the linchpin in this is this truth. You're only as strong as you are honest. The, this is it right here. If you're not ready to be honest, if you're not ready to, to be honest with yourself or be honest with others, if you're not ready to accept God's grace to conquer your bad habits, then, then you're, you're, not, you're not going to. It's that simple. But some of the strongest things that we'll ever do is surrender. Some of the strongest things that we'll ever do is be honest and tell people about it because there's this truth here. Honesty allows you to bring what is in the dark into the light. See, you can't correct what you are not willing to confront. If you're not willing to confront something, then how are you going to correct it? How are you going to invite someone else to correct that in your life? 
Because, see, we, we get worried that if we are honest about our weaknesses, if we tell people about where we fall short, that people are going to judge us. But you know what? If I'm relying on God's grace and I'm no longer trying harder, it doesn't matter because I'm trusting in God. And when I'm trusting in God, it allows me to be honest about who I am. And when I'm honest about who I am, I'm going to just name and claim the thing that I'm dealing with. And when I name and claim it, then I can let Jesus confront it. I can confront it. And the people that are in my life that are good for me, they can help me confront it. So we think that asking for help is a sign of weakness, but it's not. It's a sign of wisdom. When we ask for help, we're being wise. And see, the, the, this truth for you today is that God's grace will not only forgive you, but it will free you. So my hope for you today, when you think about your bad habits, and, and this is a, the last thing I'll say before we have a, a chance for you guys to respond, is, is as, I was, as I was working through this message, my heart just broke for those of, of us that have these secret bad habits in our life. Because when you live in secret, it's like cancer. It just consumes you. And it just wears you out. And it wears you down. And you just feel like, oh, this thing is just overcoming and taking me. And so if you've not heard anything that I've said, but if you can identify with that exhausted feeling of hopelessness, then there's this truth here that God's grace will not only forgive you, but it will free you. And the only thing you have to do is surrender. Surrender to it and accept it. And so I'm going to give you guys a chance to do that today. See, the question is, is why can't I stop? And the answer to that question of why can't I stop is simply, you don't have to. You just have to trust God. And receive the grace that he has for you. It's just, it's mind blowing that it's not three things that I need to do to overcome my bad habits. Instead, it's trusting God's grace for my life, this free gift that he gives me, because then my life becomes about worship. So then when I drive by the petrol station, I'm not worried about getting a Snickers bar. Instead, I wanna worship God because he gives his grace for me. It's a gift that pours out over me. And you know what? Not only did it forgive me, it freed me. So in, in the beginning, I, I, I talked about how I was addicted to, to dip, to tobacco. And if anyone in here smokes or dips, or whatever, there's no condemnation for you. This is not a church of condemnation. I really don't care uh, if you smoke or dip or whatever. It doesn't matter to me. Um, but in my life at the time, I knew that I shouldn't be doing it. And I knew that, that, I, that I needed to not do it, to do it. And I was leading a ministry and around kids and, you know, in a real influential age. And I was trying to quit and I was trying to quit. And what it came down to, it, it wasn't the fact that, that tobacco was so bad that I needed to quit tobacco. It was the fact that God was just, just telling me I needed to quit to surrender to him. And the problem really was a surrender issue. And I kept trying and trying and trying. And I wore the patches and did all the stuff and was trying to quit and never could really do it on my own power. And I'll never forget one night it was raining and I was walking out to a van and I was loading up a bunch of backpacks because I was going to take a bunch of kids um, uh, hiking in the woods. So we had high school kids and we had men. It was a mentorship program. We'd take them out hiking in the woods. And God said to me, God said, Chris, you're believing so much for these kids and these dads on this day when I have so much for you that you won't believe for yourself. Just trust me and be free. And that was it. It totally changed me. It wasn't a process. I knew the cravings were gone. It was like, boom. God took it and he changed it. And that, that's my prayer for you is that it's the encounter with God that will set you free. And so that's what we want to give you in this moment here. And, and I'm going to pray for us. And, and after I pray, the band's going to come out. And after I pray and the band comes out, uh, we're going to have these prayer partners. And this is a team that we've put together, a new team. And it's been amazing. And these teams are going to come down into the corners. And they're going to be there to pray with you and to pray for you. And if you need prayer for anything at all, Maybe you want to put your hand up and say, hey, I want to be free from this bad habit. Or maybe you, want to come, maybe you just want to celebrate a prayer with somebody. Or maybe nobody's talked to you this week and you just want to connect with somebody. Maybe you're feeling a little bit sad. 
you can come up and just say, hey, will you, will you just pray with me? We're not here to solve your problems or do miracles in your life. We're here to help you have an encounter with God. And so let me pray. Lord Jesus, I just pray that you take all the words that I've said and you